Welcome to the March Arctic Vibe, your connection to what's happening this month at Fort Wainwright, Alaska. Recorded live at the Birch Hill Ski and Snowboard Area Lodge. And now, our host, U.S. Army Garrison Alaska Commander, Colonel Nate Surrey. Hey, good afternoon, Fort Wainwright. Colonel Nate Surrey here, Garrison Commander. Uh, this is our third installment of Arctic Vibe. We uh, come to you here from Birch Hill, uh, which is brand new lodge that our families and soldiers and retirees um, and the whole community has been enjoying for several months now. Um, got a couple of hot topics I'd like to hit you with first. The first one is the housing survey. Uh, going very well so far, but we need a little bit more help. We have four neighborhoods that are well above the 30 percentile goal for each um, neighborhood. Chena Bend is at 71%, Northtown 33%, CQ Basin 39%, and Tananaw Trails at 49%. All the other neighborhoods are above 20, uh, but we'd like to get you to over 30%. So please continue to uh, uh, promote that with, our, with your neighbors. And by 7 March, which is when it's been extended to, hopefully we can hit that goal across the board. So thank you again. Next hot topic is gyms. Um, I wanted to clear the air. Malavan Gym has got structural damage to its multi-functional fitness room. There is a beam inside of there that has a major crack. It's a very old facility. Um, our DPW and Corps of Engineers has formulated a plan. The shoring that supports that beam will be up uh, hopefully by the end of this week. That basically renders that beam safe because there's a piece that's from the floor to the ceiling that'll be supporting it. That's the short-term fix. Hopefully, I get the thumbs up. To get, I gotta cross my fingers on this because it has to have an engineering and safety uh, look at this, but hopefully I get the thumbs up that once that shoring's up and the snow is removed off the roofs, that I can open up the other areas of Malavan that surround the multifunctional fitness room. However, that room itself will probably be closed for six to eight months. I was told six, I'm adding a couple months to that because that's usually the reality. And I apologize for that up front. The PFC is, is still open um, on its normal hours that you know so well. Um, however, that is gonna have some impacts a little bit because we have several hundred soldiers that are using the PFC as its main hygiene facility during the exercise for JPMRC. They will also probably be utilizing the gym to work out, so it will be a little more cramped. Those same soldiers generally will not be going to the Wolf Slayer gym, so I encourage you to go to Wolf Slayer, which is 24-7 access. We've increased the manning times there too throughout the day since Malavan is currently uh, shut down outside of, other than the pool itself. So I encourage you to register your cat card at the PFC or Wolf Slayer during the man times so that you can get in there anytime with your cat card to include throughout the evening because it's 24-7. Uh, again, apologize for the Malavan situation. Uh, hopefully that'll be resolved by the end of the summer. Okay, next top topic, uh, Community Connections um, is a wonderful program put on by our Religious Support Office. They, we did it in the fall. It met over a six to eight week period, and we're doing it again in the spring. Why is that important? Because it's all about resilience. The definition of resilience is the mental, physical, and emotional and behavioral ability to face and cope with adversity, adapt to change, recover, learn, and grow from the experience. Community Connections focuses on relationships, which is a huge portion of that mental strength and emotional strength when you face adversity. So I highly advise anyone, especially new to the Army or young families, first term families up to Alaska to get involved in this program. So I'm gonna turn it over to Chaplain John Verdugo for a quick message. Hi. I'm Chaplain John Verdugo, Garrison Chaplain for Fort Wainwright, Alaska. I want to share with you an exciting opportunity that begins April 6th at Northern Lights Chapel 
and continues every Wednesday evening at 6 p.m. It's called Community Connections. Community Connections is a spring program designed to provide Fort Wainwright with an opportunity to plug into the power of community and to develop connections filled with meaning, purpose, and identity. A free dinner is provided to all attending and free limited childcare is provided for ages two to five years of age. Various classes like Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace, Spiritual Mindfulness, and Parenting Teenagers will be offered. We'll also have programs for elementary age children and Club Beyond for our middle school and high school students. So whether you're single or married, soldier or DA civilian, and wherever life's journey has you at this time, Community Connections is meant for you. To register, simply go to the Fort Wayne Wright Facebook or our Religious Support Office Facebook and scan the Community Connections QR code. Fill out the information and submit. Or for additional information, please call 353-6276 and ask for me, Chaplain John Verdugo. I look forward to sharing more about this amazing opportunity we have to build and strengthen our community's connection to one another. And I look forward to seeing you at Northern Lights Chapel on April 6th. Register soon because space is limited. Have a great Arctic day. All right, thanks John. Appreciate that uh, quick introduction to Community Connections. Again, thumbs up. I've attended a few of the events and they are awesome. All right, so the next topic is near and dear to my heart. It's the Army Emergency Relief Program. It's the number one charity that my wife and I donate to and have been donating to for the last 24 years of our of careers. Why is why? The so what is, this is the number one way soldiers and families can get financial assistance in the time of need. It's either a no interest loan, uh, a grant, or a combination of the, the two. The three main reasons soldiers in Alaska ask for this help is emergency travel that's not covered by the regulation that pays for Oconus travel for emergency reasons. It's for automobile repairs or it's for first month's rent uh, for on or off post uh, housing. Last year, we helped 400 soldiers with a total amount of three quarters of a million dollars on Fort Wainwright through the AER program. We also gave 27 scholarships to spouses and children in a total amount of $87,000. So why am I talking about it here? Because it's knowledge. Soldiers need to know this. First Sergeant Company commanders need to know this so that um, they can call AER, but either way, this is the first place that soldiers should go to for help, not to payday lenders, not to banks, places like that. First thing you should do is go to AER. They have financial counselors there, and they will get to yes, some way or another, to get you the help you need. Okay, so I'd like to transition now over to the next topic, which is March Meltdown. All right, welcome back. So I want to introduce Abigail Crosby with our uh, Morale, Welfare, and Recreation Division, and she is going to be in charge of this year's March Meltdown. So we'll get right into the questions. So what is March Meltdown, Abigail? So March Meltdown is our end of the year hoorah here at uh, the Ski Hill. So it's a chance for us to all get together. We got a lot more sunlight in the day. Um, it's a day full of events and competitions. Um, just getting the community together and get to celebrate the season that we had and the fact that we're going into our next season. Um, we have five different events happening that day, starting with a color trek and tube. So uh, patrons can sign up and they show up at the ski hill. They trek up the side of the tubing hill on one of the cross country trails uh, to the top where they are getting hit with different color along the way. Um, and when they reach the top, they get to the top of the tubing hill and then they get to ride a tube on the way down. Wow, so it's a color trek up the mountain. 
where you get dashed with color, just like a color run, and then you tube back down? Correct. Oh, wow. On this, on the normal tube hill, right? Yes. Okay, so we're not coming all the way down the top. Mm -hmm. I remember asking that question before. Be fun, but, but very dangerous. <laughs> okay, outstanding. Okay, so five total events you said. What are some of the other events? So um, we have three other different events that are happening uh, within the park. Uh, the first one would be the Knuckle Huck. Um, the second event would be our Rail Jam. And then third event would be the Pond Skim. So, okay, the Pond Skim is what we saw in the video. Correct. What are the other two? So the Rail Jam is a, um, it's a park competition. So it's, um, you get on the different rails and you're basically competing against your peers in order to see who's the best. So it's snowboarders and skiers that know how to, uh, or have, uh, I would hope have attempted it before. The obstacles on the, on the park on the left side of the, of the mountain, that's what you're talking about? Yeah, so there's obstacles all over the mountain. Uh, they'll be actually brought together to create the rail park for that day. Oh, okay, understand. Okay, and then what's the knuckle huck? So knuckle huck is a pretty cool concept. Um, it's less of a competition and more of a freestyle sort of event. When you have um, a big jump, you have to have a landing for that jump. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning of the landing is what we call the knuckle. So that's where that starts. So if you've grown up in parks or uh, doing any kind of park activity, you know that you can come to moments where you are about to hit the jump and maybe you're just not feeling it or the lighting isn't correct or whatever it might be. So people bypass the jump but they end up hitting the knuckle and doing a trick anyways. So it's a very grassroots, um, fun, just it's a really just enjoyable uh, program to both watch and to do. Okay. Well, it sounds like fun. I, I will tell you, I will not be doing that. Um, just, I'm, I'm pretty decent snowboarding, but I've learned over the years as you get older, um, doing jumps, um, the catastrophic, uh, risk that comes with doing a jump if you don't land it right at my age yeah usually involves me going to see eli at the hospital but i i'm looking forward to watching our our all of our uh patrons participate in all those events especially the pond skim because uh i already know what's going to happen to me i'm going to do it and i'm going to my, catch my front end and face plant right <laughs> in there which is fine for me it's just like water skiing well, good. So is there any volunteer opportunities for the for um, our community to help out in this? Yeah, um, so Outdoor Rec and Birch Hill in general are always looking for volunteers. Um, they can reach out to us and we can get them uh, signed up through the VMIS program. And that gives them credit towards uh, their volunteer opportunities as well. Now, just for this event, or are you talking all the time? All the time. Okay. What are the things they can do? What are the examples? Uh, I mean, they can come in, um, just help with day-to-day -day operations. There's, we're always trying to figure out ways to you know, make the area better, whether it's here or at Outdoor Rec. Um, a lot of soldiers enjoy volunteering for some of the trips that we have with Outdoor Recreation. So getting to go on a snow machine trip and um, helping the guide and just being an extra set of hands available. So. Okay, outstanding. And then the final question is, is this the last event for Birch Hill? Um, it'll be the last event for Birch Hill, but uh, it will not be the end of our season. Luckily, we've had plenty of snow, weather permitting. Uh, we should be extending past that date. Okay, this is important to tell the community. So the decision on ending skiing operations, snow operations at Birch Hill is completely weather dependent. Absolutely. So as the melt starts and the snow conditions are no longer, so we could potentially go into April. Okay, yep. that's great news. Okay, well, Abigail, it's been wonderful to talk to you. Really appreciate it, and I'm excited for the event. Thank you. Thank you. So our next topic is, I'll just say it this way, safety during the change of seasons. Um, as we go into winter and come out of winter, what happens? Uh, well, we have freeze-thaw, which creates uh, probably two to three times more icy conditions across all of our surfaces, parking lots, sidewalks, roads, you name it. And so I just ask everybody to keep that in mind as we start to come into that situation in uh, March and April. Uh, and here's a quick video uh, that'll explain this a little bit more. Hello, Gail Murray from the Garrison Safety Office here to talk to you about ice safety. 
There's really no sure answer and there's no such thing as 100% safe ice. Ice safety is dependent on a combination of factors and not just on one factor alone. Ice safety is determined by assessing the following factors together. External temperature over a period of time and on the day, snow coverage, depth of water under the ice, the size of the body of water it is on, the chemical composition of the water, local weather fluctuations, and the extent of the ice. Take all care and precautions to avoid unnecessary risks. Here are a few visual cues you can use from carefully looking at the ice before you decide to cross it. White to opaque ice is water-saturated snow that freezes on top of the ice, forming another thin layer. Most times it's weak due to being porous from air pockets. Blue to clear ice is high density, very strong, safest ice to be on if thick enough, but stay off if it's less than four inches thick. Mottled and slushy is considered rotten ice. This ice is thawing and slushy, not suitable for even attempting to cross it. Be sure to carefully look at the ice to see if you can see any cracks, breaks, weak spots, or abnormal surfaces to identify the colors of the ice. But you cannot rely on your eyesight alone. Ice of any color subjected to a running water force underneath, like streams and rivers, will be weaker than ice not subject to that kind of pressure and erosion from beneath. The ending of winter can be a wonderful time to spend outdoors, but be careful. Do not take any unnecessary risks. If you have any questions or concerns, please give us a call at 353-7083, 7085, or 7087. All right, Fort Wainwright. Um, our next guest is Ida Peterson, who is our stormwater, sorry, our water program manager for the Department of Public Works. So, Ida, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I love talking about stormwater. Absolutely. All right, so the first question is, what is the purpose of the stormwater program? All right, well, the boring answer is it's required by state and federal law, but really the goal of the program is to minimize the amount of pollutants that our human activities are introducing into the ecosystem and all of the waters and wetlands uh, that can be affected by those pollutants. Uh, another key part of the stormwater program is thinking about the design of our uh, buildings and drainages and uh, using uh, techniques called green infrastructure and low impact development, which helps keep our stormwater in the interior of Alaska and available for the plants and animals that need it. And it also helps provide balance to the ecosystem. Well, instead of just letting it dump right back into the you know the waterways yeah so recycling it is what you're saying through the natural ground yes I think. Yeah. yeah that totally makes sense um so how much watershed are, are we concerned about here well as you probably know fort wainwright and the training lands are about 1.6 million acres managed by usag alaska and that's roughly the size of the state of delaware uh so that is a huge area to be concerned about and a lot of rivers, lakes, streams, and wetlands. What we are mostly concerned about is what we humans and our activities have on the main cantonment and what kinds of um, pollutants may be exposed to stormwater. And that may be on the airfield, in the motor pools, but even in our backyards and uh, the sewer system. Um, making sure that we don't cause sewer backups is actually a stormwater concern. Uh, so a little bit of everything we touch, um, it has a concern. So what, um, the next question I have, and that's all great information. I know mm -hmm. we'll get into, the, eventually we're gonna get into, okay, what are the important things that the families need to know, right? So the next question is, um, do we have more snow this year for melt off? I think the answer is yes. Yeah. You know, what's the volume of water consider, you know, that we, we we're going to see this year based off the roughly three, four feet of snow that are all over the place? Yeah, when I was looking at the numbers a few weeks ago, and that was before we had even more snow, it was at least twice as much as the previous three years. So I think you can imagine that we are going to have a lot more runoff. And um, honestly, it depends on how the weather um, changes uh, and how much water can soak into the ground and how much of it can run off. Um, 
It may not look like it, but right now is one of the most important seasons for stormwater and pollution prevention because all winter we've accumulated this big snowpack and the ice and uh, hidden in there are little spills from vehicle fluids, pet waste and other pollutants, litter, that once everything starts to melt, it's going right into the drainage ditches and then out towards the river and the wetlands uh, without any sort of treatment in between. Um, and also the frozen ground allows that to flow um, a lot, lar larger volume of water to flow right to those water bodies. Sure. So what areas and substances are we concerned about? That's the big, now we know, we understand. Yeah. Now, what is that we, we want to message to the families? Sure. And I mentioned um, vehicle fluids and POL. That's a big one. And it's probably pretty obvious because you can see those oil spots in parking lots. And then once the water starts to run, you see that rainbow sheen. Uh, so definitely keeping on top of those oil spills. And if your vehicle is leaking, maybe using a drip pan or getting it serviced. Um, definitely not changing your oil outdoors uh, to bring it to the auto skills center or to the uh, some other shop that can do that for you. At the very least, uh, disposing of that hazardous waste properly and the oil waste properly. Uh, another big concern is sediment which uh, comes as a, as a surprise to some people because it's just dirt, but human activities can accelerate erosion and sediment getting into especially the Chena River because that is such an important spawning stream for salmon. And it not only affects us here in Fort Wainwright in the Fairbanks area, but everything downstream. So uh, making sure not to drive over um, soil and tearing up the, the dirt, especially around post. And uh, a lot of that falls onto construction projects to making sure that they're following all of the rules and regulations. Uh, another pollutant that I would like to mention, which is uh, routinely noticed in the springtime is pet waste. And we have measured um, fecal coliform and E. coli bacteria running in the stormwater because uh, pet waste is not being cleaned up. And that can have a major effect on the aquatic organisms, um, cause algae issues um, in the rivers. And uh, this time of year, those uh, little piles are starting to pop out. So being on top of that, uh, having a routine and cleaning up every single time. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Um, and that's what our family does. And I'll be straight honest. We miss it a few times, you know, a couple days, but yeah. every single week, like clockwork, the one area where a dog, we go out and we, we pick it up. And it's a family drill that we do because you have all enlightened me on the damage that these that that collective material across the entire post can do so you do make a difference um, so that's great information for oil stuff i mean old school cat litter i mean mm -hmm. that's how you get oil peel products right off your uh your driveway for example yeah. and then you bag it up and put it and it goes to the landfill what is uh, uh and then just like you said don't drive your vehicles in the yards Right, keep them in the driveway. Right. Okay, that's all good Good information. It, you can also report those spills, and if there are, if you're noticing a bunch of sediment or, or dirt, that can be reported to the uh, Fort Wainwright spill line or okay. the environmental program. Well, and I think that's what the next final question is. We've kind oh. of talked a little bit about well, what, what do soldiers need to do, not do, which I think it really comes into the habits we talked about but then where do they go to report anything like this or even take hazardous waste too if they don't know what to do with it um good question uh definitely um i'll plug the household hazardous waste program uh, okay. at building 3489 they're also the folks who run the hazardous waste um, spill line mm -hmm. and um, can provide assistance if uh, if it's needed um, the Household Hazardous Waste Program is, is really 
uh, a way to reuse and recycle uh, products that um, uh, we'd like to minimize in the landfill and that really can be reused. So they um, normally have an assortment of vehicle fluids, paints, hobby materials, that sort of thing. So if, especially for folks who are PCSing and can't pack that stuff with them, wow. you can bring it there and say if you're looking for a certain product, um, residents can use that program 100% free. Uh, and like you said, uh, a routine, um, building those things into our habits can make a difference. Okay, well that's awesome. I, I, I learned something today like I do every time I talk with the community. Um, if you need Windex or you need, I don't know, different cleaning supplies, don't go to the store and get them. Go over to uh, building 3489 and see what's on the shelf because you're probably gonna find CLR or whatever else you can think of for free. Yeah. That's great information. Well, I, I really appreciate uh, the education you've given me into the community, and um, I hope everyone takes the advice and does the right thing to take care of our environment. Thanks, Thanks. Ida. Hello, everyone. My name is Danny Wallace, and I am the uh, chief for the Plans, Analysis, and Integration System uh, Office. Uh, we run the customer feedback program for the garrison, otherwise known as ICE, or Interactive Customer Evaluation. Most of you have used ICE or are familiar with the system, and this is an option for you to provide customer feedback on garrison services. You'll see a link to the ICE system on the screen during this presentation. Our garrison leaders always review every ICE comment that's submitted to provide timely responses to your concerns or comments. The first ICE comment that we'd like to talk about involves questions received on February 7th about the Fisher Skeet Range, which is currently closed. The customer provided the following comment. The range has not been open going on three years, if not longer. Could a status be provided on what exactly is the issue and the plan for the Skeet Range? It almost feels as though false advertisement is occurring. If it's not going to be opened anytime soon, then why not remove the mention of the skeet range from the website and take down the signs throughout the garrison? Hey, thanks, Danny. And uh, thank you to the, the individual that uh, provided this comment. Um, the skeet range uh, was mothballed, uh, meaning not torn down and permanently closed, but temporarily closed about five years ago uh, due to underutilization. The Skeet Range, just like Birch Hill and the golf course, are what we call Category C facilities. What that means is they have to be self-contained through their revenue. The money they make at least breaks even to operate the facility. We did not have the customer base previously. All right, so the current status. I have tasked my team to figure out a way to get to yes. I would like to open up the Skeet Range again this summer and we will do that over a certain test time frame and I'm sure that it, the information is put across all venues website social media and whatnot then I employ the community to utilize it so that we can continue to keep it open more to follow on that but I absolutely want to get the seat skeet range up and running again and and provide the community the opportunity to use it We also continue to receive positive comments on MWR trips. Last month, we received the following comment stating, Joe and Cassie did a phenomenal job as guides for the women in the wilderness trip. They were friendly, patient, and had excellent customer service. With their expertise, they safely navigated us through the terrain, and we felt like we were in great hands and really enjoyed the trip. I'm going to recommend to others that they do this tour with Joe and Cassie. Thank you for the wonderful experience and memories. So, wonderful comment. Um, we don't see as many positive comments that we would like because usually when people are satisfied, they don't have the urge to go in and, and take the time to actually put in a comment like this. Um, it's just human nature, right? I'm the same way. Um, but this was greatly appreciated. Um, and so our Abigail, who we interviewed earlier, responded to the customer, um, thanking her for this wonderful positive comment because Joe and Cassie do, do uh, 
actually do a wonderful job and it's great to get that positive feedback. So again, thank you very much for that, for taking that time out of your busy day to provide that uh, great positive reinforcement to our employees. Hello, I'm Community Relations Specialist Eve Baker, and I'm here to introduce Carl Heim, a project manager with Alaska Department of Transportation and Public Facilities. Carl's going to talk about the new GARS intersection changes and what's coming for the main gate area outside Fort Wainwright. So Carl, welcome. Thank you, sir, for having me. So I'm gonna first tell everybody what GARS stands for, Gaffney Road, Airport Way, Richardson Highway, and Steeth Expressway. That's the each of the that's G A R S. So now you know what the when you hear GARS, it's that intersection. And there's gonna be major construction going on there. And so uh, without further ado, I'll get right into the questions. So why redo this GARS intersection, Carl? So it's the second busiest intersection in Fairbanks. The first busiest one is the, the Johansson Expressway in Geist. There's about 35,000 cars a day going through there. And there's a lot of crashes that have happened over the last five to 10 years when we looked at data. And what makes this intersection super interesting is that everybody has to go by themselves, like one leg at a time. And we still have a super high crash rate and there's a lot of delay there. So we want to eliminate that for the community. Okay, that makes total sense. So when is the work happening? So the project's gonna start this summer. Construction is gonna occur in 2022 and 2023. So you'll see equipment out there probably in May of this year. We're gonna build all of the off alignment improvements or all the improvements outside of the core intersection first. So disruption should be minimal in the first season. Then we're gonna come back in the second season and, and rebuild the core intersection. There won't be any really long-term delays or closures like people have seen over the last couple of years in Fairbanks. We will take advantage of a two week closure to finish up the third street project that's just north a little bit to do some heavy excavation work on the north side of the intersection uh, just to kind of make it a little bit easier for construction this summer. Okay, so I just wanna make sure my, that, that our community understands. Will main gate access be restricted at any time in 20, this summer or next summer? It will not. It will not, okay, but it might be slower yeah, absolutely. There okay. will be delays. Um, there will be some congestion due to the heavy construction equipment. Um, sometimes there could be delays experienced up to 15 to 20 minutes, depending on which way you're going. Okay. You're still going to be able to make it through the intersection and you're still going to be able to get to the main gate. Okay, so we will do a great information campaign on this via the, our social media, uh, via websites and whatnot, because we're going to react at the garrison based on how this is working. Um, and make sure the community understands that at this time or this couple weeks, there's probably gonna be longer delays. We recommend using trainer or using Badger and taking an alternate route. And there's always the option for us to temporarily open up other gates uh, like South Gate that can release people out that way or even Lazelle like we had before. But the garrison will work uh, as a combined team along with uh, yourself and your team to understand where we're at in, this, in those projects throughout the two summers to, to do our absolute best to minimize uh, any delays. Um, so I guess the next point would be, how does this new intersection work? So it, it, if, if you go to the website, there's dotalaska.gov, Northern Region, you can go to Gars Intersection and there's a lot of great videos out there that'll kind of show you how it works. But the way this intersection is operating, the rights go right, throughs go through, lefts go left. It's pretty much business as usual, with the exception that the lefts get to go with the throughs, which you don't normally see at a traditional intersection. Usually you're either restrained by a green arrow or a green ball and you're waiting for a left turn. Lefts go with the throughs, which allow you to push way more cars through a smaller space. That's why this intersection is, is so great for this location. Yeah, that does make sense. Um, I'm excited to, I've seen the video about six months ago when I first came in, um, and I'm definitely looking forward to seeing it again. I think we're about ready to show that video insert right now.
So now that we've seen the video, uh, Carl, I got one more question for you, and that who all is involved in this project, Big Ski? So everybody that I can think of in Fairbanks is involved in this project, or at least it feels like we've talked to everybody. FHWA, local trucking agencies, city of Fairbanks, all the stakeholder groups. I think we've talked to just about everybody. And of course, the great people out here on Fort Wainwright, your, your division of uh, uh, your public involvement people have been really great. And they've actually been really helpful in helping us get the word out and, and bringing us out here and giving us the chance to talk about it. So we really do appreciate that very much. And we look forward to that opportunity to keep working with your team as well. So. No, I, Carl, I, I, we appreciate it. This is great open communication. And um, like I said, as we progress through the process, uh, it'll help uh, that, that great coordination we have will help the garrison team figure out where we can adjust our gate hours, gate times, gate locations in order to minimize um, distraction and delays for our, our families uh, and workers that come in off post so, or go off post either way. So again, we look forward to the great uh, coordination with you over the next two years. And thank you uh, for organizing all of this um, and, and making our intersection a safer place. Thank you, sir. We appreciate it. We look forward to working with you as well. Thanks so much, Carl. Hey, Fort Wainwright. Staff Sergeant Trigger here with another helping of what's happening this month. If you're in need of more hockey after watching the Army crush the Air Force last month, then make plans to see the Fairbanks Ice Dogs take on the Anchorage Wolverines for their military appreciation game March 19th. The puck drops at 7.30 at the Big Dipper Ice Arena. Do you want to make a difference in your community? The Army Emergency Relief Campaign runs from March 1st through May 15th and is a great opportunity to help members of our military team who may be experiencing unexpected challenges. Soldiers Helping Soldiers is what we do. Contact your local AER officer or visit them in the Welcome Center for more information. In observance of the opening of Linton Journey, Northern and Southern Lights Chapels will be holding their Ash Wednesday services March 2nd. Contact the Religious Support Office or visit them on Facebook for times and locations. Well, that's it for my report. Be sure to get out and enjoy this great state as warmer temperatures start rolling in. And remember your safety brief. Make good choices and don't become a statistic. Hi, Dan Kane here with USAG Alaska MWR to talk to you today about Seward Military Resort down in lovely Seward, Alaska. So we are currently taking reservations for the uh, 2022 season. Um, we do have a one year advance uh, allowance. So you can reserve up until uh, 2023. 2022 does have a lot of reservations. However, due to COVID cancellations, uh, we may have lots of available space this summer. Uh, Seward is looking at opening up full bore again. So they're looking at bringing in additional tour boats. Uh, those are the large cruise ships. And so we expect all of the businesses in Seward to be open. So it should be a great summer to get down there and enjoy uh, the beauty of summer Alaska. Uh, we do have an upcoming sale that I want to make everybody aware of. Uh, we have a 50% sale going on for Kenai Fjords tickets. Uh, those will be available from 1 March until 30 April for the 2022 season. And there will be no blackout dates um, and no restrictions on those purchases. So uh, if you're interested in seeing Kenai Fjords down in Seward, this is a great opportunity to save some money and see the beautiful, beautiful park. Uh, just a reminder, Seward Military Resort uh, is a standalone resort down in Seward. Uh, it is run completely by the Army MWR. Uh, we do have cottages, we have suites, we have hotel rooms, uh, RV slots, and campsites available. Uh, we even have a couple of yurts down there that are reservable. So feel free to give them a call, uh, check them out online, see what they've got available, and take the opportunity to come and see Alaska or just see it while you're here for your tour. Thanks. For Wayne Wright, so that brings us to the end of our Arctic Vibe third iteration. This time is at Birch Hill. Um, our next Arctic Vibe will be at the School Age Center at 12:30 on Thursday, the 31 March. So come out and join us live there. A um, couple quick plugs: get out and ski. The the last few weekends that we have, you know, roughly a month, give or take. The powder is really fresh out here. Um, the best skiing, I, I, again, 20 years ago I was here, and this hill was never in this good a condition. 
So we have great conditions out here. So get out here and enjoy the last uh, month. And then one last plug for the housing survey. We've got another couple weeks, roughly week I think it is. Um, get out there and get us over the hump for 30%. Have a wonderful rest of your uh, winter. Next time I'll see you, we'll probably be starting our meltdown. Take care.